Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Terry here. We'll just give it a few more minutes and uh, as a few more people come in and uh, we'll go from there. So if you have some questions tonight, um, put them in the Q&A session and we'll be taking, as we did last week, uh, frequent stops uh, at the end of each major section and we'll have a little uh, Q&A then. Uh, Chris and Kelly are online and they will um, uh, be handing those questions through to me um, uh, as we finish uh, each session. And hopefully uh, I'll be able to answer a few. I'm in a uh, motel room in Sydney tonight. Uh, it's a bit cooler here than in central Queensland, so hence the coat. Well, we're waiting for a few people to come in. If there was any uh, questions uh, from last week, that uh, you've thought of through the week and uh, would like to put up there, uh, now's a good opportunity. So the first question uh, was, uh, yet uh, is this meeting recorded? Uh, was the first meeting recorded and is there a link? Uh, there is, um, and Chris, Eccleston will be able to uh, email you a link to that recording. Tonight's session will also be recorded uh, and that uh, will be available also to download uh, or get access to by the end of the week. So still a few people uh, piling in. So we'll just um, we'll wait uh, about another minute and a half and then we'll get underway. Thanks for your questions, Alberto. Whereabouts are you? All right, well, I think we'll get underway. Uh, there might be a few more come in uh, as we uh, as we get rolling. Uh, oh, we got Roberto all the way from uh, Brazil, but over in Perth at the moment. Okay, well, uh, good to have you on board, Roberto. Okay, uh, so tonight I'm going to cover a few things. Uh, firstly, a little bit about uh, the regulations. I'm going to cover that in a couple of sections. Um, one is firstly around what is a project, uh, and then we'll dig in a little bit deeper into some of the regulations that we, we have to abide by and how some of that works. Uh, and then we will get into the economics uh, and uh, a few things uh, in the real world. Um, <clears throat> Okay, 
Oops, my noise uh, that work. There we go. Um, so as I mentioned, so we're going to talk about projects, methods, uh, what's an ACU, et cetera. Um, uh, we've talked a bit about measurement. We're going to talk about economics, um, timelines, eligibility, um, and uh, it's pretty hard to stop me talking about methane, so I will uh, also talk a little bit about that. So let's kick off with a, with a carbon project. Uh, firstly, it covers a defined area. And it doesn't have to be a whole farm. It can be part of a farm or it can cover several farms. But a project is the official um, uh, area over which a project uh, is, is running. Um, and that project area could have one or more carbon estimation areas. Now, carbon estimation areas are the areas that credits are issued against. So if you had a property that had say three carbon estimation areas, then each of those carbon estimation areas will have its credits calculated uh, and it will, um, your, your credits will be issued on the CEA. So one CEA might perform really well and one might not perform as well, um, but uh, each one will be issued their own credits. Uh, for a carbon to be, a project to be real, it must be registered. Uh, it's got to be registered with the clean energy regulator, particularly if you want ACUs. Um, and it's got to be credited under an approved methodology or method. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, and a carbon project has the capacity to create carbon credits. And one credit is one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent. There are lots of approved methods. Um, let me just get rid of this thing. Um, so they detail how projects are run and measured. So these are the rules um, laid down by the regulator. Uh, so basically, it's like the recipe of how you actually go about doing things. Uh, there's at least 37 methods approved now in all sorts of different areas cover multiple seg segments so sectors including agriculture uh etc cetera, etc cetera. the obviously the one uh, we're focusing on tonight is agriculture and soil carbon within agriculture um they also vary in their requirements uh complexity time frames etc uh this is a few months old it was a few months ago 1251 projects registered that's gone up a little bit since then um and the uh, procedure is that the, the regulator will develop new methods uh, every year or so. Um, and the target is five new methods a year, um, but we'll see how that goes. So what we, we talked about uh, last time, the difference between sequestration and an avoided emission. Um, and Got um, sequestration. So, firstly, you know it's important to know that not all credits are created equal, and the market is differentiating now between credits of different quality. So, it differentiates based on price. Um, ACUs or ACCUs are backed by the Australian government, um, but so let's just compare a soil uh, carbon project and a vegetation or tree project. Uh, generally, a soil project, once you get carbon below about uh, 20 to 30 centimetres, that's going to be stable for around about 1,000 to 2,000 years. Uh, the deeper that carbon gets, the longer that stability period lasts. By the time you get down to one and a half to two metres, carbon is stable for around the 10,000 to 13,000 years. Um, vegetation, on the other hand, is susceptible to fire. So... If you're doing vegetation projects, one of your key strategies is to protect them from fire. Soil is much, much slower to accumulate uh, than vegetation. So vegetation tends to be faster initially, but ceases on maturity. So we can continue to add carbon to soils forever. Not that you'll get paid for it, but uh, we can. Um, and the... 
it, trees will often, uh, they'll start off very slow. They'll have a period uh, where their sequestration rate from about five years through to 15 years is probably going to be faster than most soils. And then through to the 25 year period, that, that slows right down and then ceases. Soil carbon methods at this stage are measured, whereas when you, we, you do a, a vegetation project, it's actually modelled. Um, soil carbon has significant agricultural production benefits, and we covered some of those last week. Um, vegetation, depending on the vegetation project, um, if, that, if the timber thickens and thickens and thickens, it may eventually detract from production. And that's... That's a risk that you need to take into account when you're looking at vegetation projects. Uh, soils and vegetation from late 2023. So um, this was supposed to be out by now, but uh, has been delayed due to the Chubb uh, review. Uh, we're now not expecting to get these things combined until around about September, October 2023, but we'll see when that comes out. Um, Soil carbon requires very good management in order to accumulate it. Um, vegetation is much easier to accumulate it. So it's a, it's a much easier sort of project to do vegetation compared to soils. Um, soil is a very complex method, um, whereas vegetation is a little bit simpler, although they are both uh, complex. Um, so, it might surprise most people, but Australia actually leads the world in this space. And late last year, I was in uh, in Europe um, and found that Australia is really ahead of the game. Um, firstly, we have the carbon farming legislation, which was enacted in 2011 under the Carbon Farming Initiative. That is bipartisan policy, um, so it's unlikely to be scrapped by either political party. So we have we have the legislation, we have governments on board with sequestering carbon in landscapes. Um, we have the clean energy regulator that is a body responsible for regulating the whole thing. And then if you don't have a regulator, you're going to end up with with a wild west and uh, you know all sorts of problems. The, we also have methodologies, which uh, as I mentioned before, is about 37 of these now, and they tell us how to do it, how to actually calculate carbon abatement or offsets, uh, and how to calculate the CO2 equivalents in whatever it is that you do. And they, that's the, the, uh, the methodologies or the recipes that set out the rules. So we have rules, and we have Australian carbon credit units, and we have a market developing. So. That is the envy of a lot of the rest of the world. Believe it or not, all of those systems are not in place in Europe. They're not in place in the United States. Um, they're sort of in place to, to some degree in parts of Canada, um, but very few places in the world will you actually see all of those things together that makes trading carbon from farms possible. Um, as we've already mentioned, uh, an ACU, an ACCU, is one ton of uh, carbon credits, or one ton of, of CO two. Now, once you've got ACUs, there's a number of things you can do with them. Um, you could have an abatement contract with the government. Um, not that I'd recommend that now. Then they're, they're uh, not worth what the market is actually paying. Um, you could trade or hold them. So. Your credits go into uh, what's called your ANREU account, um, which is like a bank account where your credits are actually held. And that, that uh, bank account or registry is controlled and managed by the federal government. Um, or you, so once they're in, in your bank account there, you can either leave them there um, and hold them for uh, droughts or you know poorer seasons or when you need to cash flow or you can uh, trade them straight away. Um, and I'm gonna come back to surrendering credits to become carbon neutral a little bit later. Um, all right, so why invest in a carbon project? Uh, your real focus should be firstly focused on your business. If we're talking soil carbon uh, or even tree carbon into your landscape, your first 
priority is to make sure that your business is going to benefit from whatever it is that you do. Um, that could be through increased productivity, increased resilience, better drought resilience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so first and foremost, you focus on your business. And I believe that soil carbon or credits out of this then should be treated um, as a bonus uh, for you getting your production system right. So do it for the right reasons and then treat the carbon as a bonus out of that. Um, and as we said the other night, um, you know, we'll get improved productivity, diversified returns. Um, it certainly will build resilience uh, within our business as we add soil carbon. And we're going to get better natural ecosystems and uh, biodiversity created. Um, and we're going to be drawing down emissions, uh, drawing down CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, but first and foremost, your own business. Um, so to do a project, basically, you've got to firstly register with the Clean Energy Regulator. And you cannot start your project until registration. And the regulator can take three months to do that registration from the time you submit your application. Uh, then after that, we can we undertake the sampling. Um, we can actually undertake the sample uh, baseline sampling when the uh, registration is submitted. So we don't actually have to wait until it is actually registered. So there's a little bit of a risk there if you do that. Um, but generally your projects are going to be registered. Um, then there's, there's monitoring, reporting, auditing, uh, and so on. And eventually it's are issued. It's are issued over, you have a choice of a 25 year permanence period or a 100 year permanence period. Um, and most people are, are, are running with a 25 year permanence period, but we do have some properties that are, looking at or have accepted the 100 year permanence period. If you accept the 100 year permanence period, um, you get 20% more credits for the whole 25 year period. We'll come back to that a little bit more. Uh, so just open that up for questions now around uh, the projects and uh, the regulator, et cetera. Uh, and then we'll, we'll uh, take a deep dive. Um, so I'll just go in Q&A and see what's there. How can we access the different approved uh, methodologies? Um, so these are only available in Australia for uh, um, Australian carbon credits, obviously, ACCUs. Um, they can be downloaded from uh, the uh, Department of Climate Change, I think they are. The departments have got all sorts of names, but they're climate change and other things. Um, but that's uh, that's where you will uh, download the methodologies. Uh, they're very large and complex documents. Um, but, uh, yep, you're free to... Anybody can go and download those methods and, uh, and read them. So, Alan, you've got a question there... Um, can we sell our accus on the world market? <clears throat> the answer at this stage is no. Um, and the reason for that is reasonably straightforward in that every country in the world wants carbon credits that are created within their environment. So within the Australian environment, the Australian government wants to count those credits in, uh, you know, against our Paris um, agreements, et cetera, and against the... the um, you know, the drawdown and, and the, the lowering of emissions that we're after. Um, so if if you sell your ACUs to, say, somebody in Canada, uh, then those credits cannot be put against Australia's uh, requirements to lower uh, our emissions, et cetera. So Canada gets the benefit of credits that were actually created in Australia. Um, so that's the primary reason, but there are mechanisms in the process of being developed that would hopefully allow us to do that in future. Um, and the reason for um, th th this has become pretty important uh, is that the price of a carbon credit overseas is three times the price of a carbon credit in Australia. So eventually this will open up uh, to a world market, but uh, the mechanisms of how to do that, so how to swap credits between countries and that sort of stuff is still being worked out. 
Uh, ben, uh, with good management, do you think you could sequester carbon for 100 years? Also, if property is sold in the meantime, well, let's go to the 100 year one first. Um, I think a lot of people will be able to sequester carbon for 100 years or 500 years. You won't get paid for it though. Um, so when you have, so we've got within the soil a thing called saturation point that we talked a little bit about um, last week. And let's say your saturation point of your soil where you are might be uh, 3% <clears throat> organic carbon. So when your soils are 3% organic carbon all the way to the uh, sea horizon, which will be the solid clay or the rock or whatever you run into, um, then you will start building soil. Or even before that, you will actually start building soil. So um, we can, like your percent carbon won't increase, but you'll just start and you'll just be building soil. So yes, we can continue to add carbon to soils. Um, if the property sold in the meantime and you cash out all your accus sequestered and new owners don't sequester anything or actually lose carbon, who's responsible for paying back the accus? Any accus lost in future are the responsibility of the new owner. Um, you uh, have sold what you um, sequestered and that's fine. You will sell a property with an ongoing project. It is the up to the incoming owner as to what they actually do with that. So um, they have the, they could cancel it. Uh, they could decide to continue the project or they could decide to tear it all up. Now, uh, if they, if it's a, a grazing based project, um, I think it's highly likely that it will be deemed that that carbon will remain for the rest of the permanence period. Um, and there won't be any penalty for changing the grazing system. If however, they come in and plow it all up, that's the quickest way to get carbon out of a soil that we know of. Um, then there's uh, the satellites that are likely to pick that up and they will be responsible for the credits that they've actually burnt out of the soil. Um, can I explain the difference between mineral versus particulate carbon fractions? Um, yep, so it's mineral associated or uh, POC, which is the uh, particulate organic carbon. So particular organic carbon is the breakdown of organic matter. So you start with, um, you know, leaves and roots and so on, which die. Um, they start to break down. They're broken down by, uh, by various microorganisms. And gradually the size of those uh, particles get smaller and smaller. And eventually once they've been uh, digested by right down to the bacterial level, um, they become very, very small particles. Essentially, they become humus. And once they become a humic compound, uh, colloid, then they will be binding with the minerals in the soil. Um, so your, your, your uh, POC or the particulate organic carbon is basically um, all the way from organic matter through to organic carbon, but it's still, uh, you know, uh, the particle size gets smaller and smaller. And the I think the difference is uh, the particular organic carbon is above about 53 microns and the uh, mineral associated organic carbon is below 53 microns. Also, if accus are required to be repaid, is the rate at the market value at the time? Yep, it's the market value at the time. Okay, so we will... Uh, um, uh, uh, this is a question here about uh, calculators. So I might come back to that one uh, a little bit later. We'll uh, talk about um, once we get into talking about emissions and so on. Um, all right, so we've uh, talked a little bit about methods. So there, there are industrial and land methods. Uh, under land, there's vegetation, savanna burning, then there's agricultural ones. Under agriculture, you've got some for piggery, some for cattle, some for dairy, cotton, etc. But the one we're discussing here is the soil carbon method. Um, so let's have a look at um, projects. A project can run for 35 years. So let's have a look at how that could be. Um, 
So you have what's called a 25-year crediting period. That means you can get paid for carbon sequestered over 25 years. Now, it doesn't matter whether you have a 25-year or a 100-year permanence period, the crediting period remains at 25 years. So we start at what's called T0 or time zero, uh, and the... Uh, um, so we start it and we register, we register and we baseline. So when we do a baseline, we're baselining the soil carbon that's measuring what's there to start with, but we also do an emissions baseline. And the emissions baseline is counting the emissions over the last five years. So we've got to go back five years and look at numbers of livestock, class of livestock. From that, we can calculate methane emissions. Uh, we need to know fertilizers used, fuel used, things like that. Um, they're all emissions. And uh, even lime, uh, adding lime, for example, uh, is, is an emission. So, so we go back get T0, but we're going back five years from there um, to get your baseline emissions. From there, uh, move forward um, and you've now got, if you, if you select a 25 year permanence period, it ends up being about 30 years. And I'll explain that uh, now because if at the end of 25 years, you did a final measurement, then the, you wait another five years for your permanence period to be extinguished. So your permanence then, although it's theoretically a 25 year period, there's a, there's a five year, up to five years or so added to the end uh, past your final um, sequestration measurement. Um, so from there, we do what's called T1 or time one, um, somewhere between three and five years. So we need to, to allow time for the carbon to be sequestered in the soil to a level at which we can measure the change. Now, the slower your sequestration rate, so if you've been through a drought or you're in a uh, country that is sequestering lower, uh, slower, then we would uh, leave it definitely for five years. If you're in a country that's gonna be pouring the carbon into the soil at a couple of tonnes per hectare per year, then we could come back and uh, do this at, in, in you know three or four years. Um, that is where you get your first credits. Um, to get those credits, you have to measure the change in soil organic carbon between T0 and T1, minus any additional emissions, uh, and then that has to go through an audit. And generally, these projects are going to be audited at T1. Uh, and over the 25 years, you're likely to get three audits. And the audit is, a, is an external um, uh, audit required by the regulator, and it's a very high level audit, high standard audit, I should say. Um, and then let's say, assume we do this every five years, and these things will change a little bit as we go forward, and I'll explain that a bit later as well. So essentially, we carry out the project. <coughs> um, now, after we do the baseline on T1, or after registration, that's when you need to start your new practice, um, but you can't start that until registration uh, has been finalized. <clears throat> so it gets a little bit confusing. So if we take the, the five year emission period plus the extra five years added on the end for your permanence, um, you've essentially got a project that could run for 35 years uh, with a 25 year crediting period and a 25 year permanence period. Now, all of that stays the same except the permanence period would go out to 100 years um, if you elect a 100-year permanence period and you'll get a lot more credits on the way through if you do that. <clears throat> um, so how do we, you know, what's the process here? So um, it really starts with, with uh, what we call the net impact plan in Carbon Link, which is, you know, what's your eligib eligibility, uh, eligibility like? Um, you learning the requirements, us learning whether you're likely to be able to um, sequester carbon in your environment or not. Uh, we get in and do some of the mapping um, 
And at this stage, we generally have to buy uh, imagery to cover the area. Um, we'll work with you to determine the new activities. Um, we'll estimate costs, et cetera. And you will also need at this stage, um, the uh, land management strategy, which has got to go with registration. So we, we then submit your registration to the, to the regulator. Um, and that goes with the mapping, that goes with the land management strategy uh, and the documents which you complete, which, which Carbon Link will help you complete um, to get registered. Now, once you're registered, and I'll say that can take up to three months, um, we're ready to baseline. And then we will, uh, at that point, and, and generally during that registration process, we will be working on the historical emissions baseline. So the better the quality data you've got over the last five years, the better that'll be. Um, and then we can, we'll can measure your baseline stocks. Then you carry out the new practice and away we go. And then, then it repeats itself over the next uh, 20 years till we get through to year 25. Um, so that's uh, basically the process. Um, so registration, there's all the details. So you you become what's called the proponent. That means that um, the credits belong to you. Um, and it's you that's actually registered with the Clean Energy Regulator or your entities, whatever you want to put it in. Uh, the, the areas have got to be mapped and uh, the regulator's uh, really tight on mapping. Um, We've got to check things with you along with mortgages, lessors, banks, native title, uh, crown land, you've got to get approvals. Um, so sometimes there's a lot of approvals that are required and we certainly need uh, bank consent. Sometimes these interest holder consents can take a while to get. Uh, the land management strategy is something that's independently uh, uh, written. Um, there's got to be evidence that the land is eligible land. And I'll talk about stuff that's not eligible a bit later. Um, and there'll be a forward abatement estimate, which goes to the regulator. Um, land management strategy is required, and this is partly for your benefit and partly for uh, the regulator to know that you know what you're doing and, you, and they know what the practice change is and the auditor knows what the practice change is that you're going to make. Um, so that it gets submitted, it, it's reviewed every five years um, and the, the details of the practice change have to be recorded and then you must provide evidence to the auditors of the practice change that you've made. Now that could be date um, and location stamp photographs. Um, it can be receipts for you know seed that you purchased or fencing material that you purchased, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the land management strategy has got to address the risks associated with the project uh, and, um, and outline the mitigation strategies that, that uh, you're going to implement to, uh, to handle the risks. Um, and that's got to be drafted by a qualified person. Um, generally uh, for Carbon Link RCS is, is uh, writing those for, for quite a lot of people at the moment. Um, so your new activities, um, your new activity has to be a practice that is going to increase soil organic carbon. And fortunately, there's quite a few things that, that are allowable. Um, and you must carry out at least one activity across all the project areas. Um, must be new or materially different. Um, carried out until the end of the permanence period. It can be changed over time. So as we learn more and uh, so on, then we'll be able to update the land management strategies uh, and get better and better at it as we go. Um, so eligible new activities, altering the stocking rate, duration or intensity of grazing. So if you're into grazing and uh, you add a whole lot more paddocks and increase the density, um, say above a threshold or something like that, then that qualifies. Um, applying fertilizers, synthetic or non-synthetic, and believe it or not, until the end of uh, 2021, we're not allowed to put non-synthetics on. Um, planting legumes is a, another one, particularly deep-rooted legumes in pastures where there's not much legume. Um, 
re-establishing rejuvenating pastures. These are, are fairly big ones, applying lime, gypsum, etc., to ameliorate soil. So if you've got a, I saw one the other day, a calcium magnesium ratio that's way out of whack. Um, and we've got to apply gypsum to those soils to loosen them up, get the air in, get the water in and, and get the bugs operating. Um, so that would be a, a new practice. Um, it's a, there's a whole lot of other stuff there. Um, and uh, yeah, But those ones at the top that I highlighted uh, are probably the key ones. Converting uh, to from, a, from cropping country to grazing country certainly qualifies. Uh, planting cover crops. Um, particularly uh, multi-species multi -species cover crop, um, bringing clay up from depth, etc. cetera. Um, so there are some restricted practices. Um, you cannot completely destock. There's a, there's a misnomer and a misunderstanding that sequestering carbon in soils is about destocking. Um, in fact, it is not, you are not allowed to destock, except in droughts and exceptional circumstances, et cetera, that's fine. But uh, completely destocking over a period of, you know, a long period of time is not allowable. Um, there are some restrictions around clearing and thinning. Um, where we're headed, uh, what I understand towards the end of this year, um, we're, we're headed towards a thing called client controlled canopy. Um, I don't know what that exactly looks like at the moment, but um, what it means to me at this stage is that we are going to be allowed to control the canopy um, to keep it open over time. Uh, what restrictions there'll be on that, uh, we don't really know yet, but at least that's the first bit of common sense I've heard talked in this space for some time. Um, restricted uh, non-synthetic fertilisers, um, one of these would be biochar. So for example, uh, biochar must be sourced from within the, the CEA um, or a designated waste stream. So if you got biochar from a designated waste stream, so maybe from a Shire Council or something like that, um, then um, you can apply that, but it's got to be applied at less than 100 kilos per hectare. That becomes an emission then, um, and the carbon that you apply with that biochar then it's got to be subtracted from the, the sequestration. Um, so there's a few restrictions there. Um, when we get to uh, eligible project areas. Um, so those are areas once we've, we've taken out ineligible areas from a project. So, um, so here's a, a you know a large one in uh, in WA. There's there's mining tenements over that. There's uh, native title tenements, um, and so there's a few issues to sort out uh, with a project like that before it's uh, it can go ahead. Um, we always end up with exclusion areas. So in this this uh, shot here, the uh, the red is excluded. Uh, that would be heavy timber, creek lines. Um, you know, or fence lines, those sort of things, roadways, yards, all of those things uh, are excluded. Um, we can do a soil carbon project in forested areas, provided the forested area is open enough for us to drive trucks in and, and be able to take the samples. Um, if you have gone and cleared some country just now uh, and uh, you are ineligible for at least five I think it's five years um, before you can start a, a soil carbon project. Um, so there's a few other areas that uh, are ineligible. Mentioned the carbon estimation areas. So these are the areas that your credits are going to be issued to. Um, so there's some real science behind getting these right. Um, and uh, so there's a uh, you'd certainly need to, you might even have a small property and still have a couple of CEAs on it um, due to significant differences in your soil types or, or management practices. Where we're headed to in future um, is a, an approach where we'll be combining things like remote sensing, um, direct measurement, but the amount of direct measurement will reduce um, and things like machine learning. And we are already using uh, machine learning uh, within uh, within carbon link now for um, and some of the maps I've shown you have actually been created uh, by machine learning. So over time we expect um, costs to come down a little bit. 
um, as some of these newer methods and uh, all of these things start to combine. Uh, we can't combine them yet because we don't have enough baseline, base data really uh, to be able to pull a lot of these things together uh, in the short term, but it's on its way. Um, I might just pull up there before I get into emissions, because uh, once I get into emissions, I could get carried away. So I'll, we'll uh, just uh, see what questions we have. There are existing CO2 calculators available in the internet, other different approved methodologies, including specific approved calculators. The, the methodologies do include their own approved calculators uh, for calculating emissions. So the, um, the models and stuff you'll find on the internet do not qualify um, within the methods. So the methods have their own way of calculating it. What's the best technology methodology available in the market for carbon measurement on soil fields? Well, the one I went through last week, um, I believe is the best at this stage, uh, Roberto. Um, but technology changes and uh, we're only staying across uh, new technologies uh, and looking at new stuff all the time. Uh, is the non-synthetic fertiliser uh, not permitted to include compost or compost extract. So it would include compost, but it would restrict you to 100 kilos per hectare of compost. Um, and compost extract is, uh, is not excluded because you're putting on compost extract at you know, only two or three kilos per hectare. So, and biological inputs um, not excluded because uh, you're only putting them on in uh, very small quantities, John. Uh, what's the prospect, uh, John, number two, what's the prospect of biological fertilisers being included? Um, yeah, for some silly reason, um, pretty well up until uh, December 2021, pretty well everything that a regenerative farmer would use to build soil carbon was excluded because it was biological. Um, we have now at least got some something there in terms of biological inputs. Um, so it it may improve over time, but at the at the moment there is a that one hundred kilogram per hectare limit. Um, but I think uh, that I'd have to check on the detail of that, but I think it might be hundred kilograms per hectare per year. Um, on uh, completely destocking a CEA, is this allowed if you're converting to all cropping? Could you please elaborate? Um, so if you were converting to cropping, that would be included in your land management strategy. And then you would have to be, you could do one or two things. Um, you could exclude that land from your CEAs uh, and just crop it in the way you wanted to, or you could include it and do management practices that are gonna sequester carbon under a crop. And we'll be getting into that uh, next week, uh, how you do some of those. So I um, hope that answers that one for you, Alan. All right, we will move on. Um, emissions. Um, increases. Uh, so we, I think the beauty of the system is it is in Australia at the moment is that when you do a soil carbon project, for example, you have baseline emissions and that's your average emissions over the last five years. At this stage, you're not expected to go below those, um, but you're not expected to go above them either. And I'll come back and we'll talk about that in a lot more depth. So your emissions are things like livestock, obviously for methane, synthetic fertilizers and nitrogen uh, urea sources or nitrogen so sources are the big ones. And that's all about nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is a huge one because um, it has a multiplier of 312. So one tonne of nitrous oxide is equivalent to 312 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. So um, it's a big one. Lime application, um, you might wonder why lime is an emission. And the reason is it's a calcium carbonate. So if you're putting on a tonne of lime per hectare, you're also putting on inorganic carbon. Um, and that has to be uh, removed from your total carbon uh, so, you know, the total carbon in your soil. 
um, crop residues uh, and uh, tillage. So, um, so tillage obviously using fuel, that's uh, an emission source. Um, pasture renovation, the, the emission source there could be your fertilizers or your fuel, but pasture renovation is an allowable um, activity. Um, landscape mod modification, so, you know, uh, things like rehydration, um, all those things, they're allowable, uh, but there could be emissions associated with them and, and they would be mostly fuel um, and uh, biochar application, which we've uh, talked about. So you're limited to 100 kilos per hectare biochar. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about methane. Um, and this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine because I think it is over talked about, overestimated, and uh, should not be encountered, but shouldn't be encountered in the first place. So when we talk about carbon dioxide, it's what's called a stock gas. So if we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it actually stays there for a very long time. You know, uh, has a half life of around a thousand years, for example. So um, that's what's called a stock gas. So in other words, it can re it can build its level in the atmosphere. Methane is what's known as a flow gas. Methane goes into the atmosphere. It's then converted into CO2 um, and water, which then forms rainfall. And how bad is that? Um, and, and comes back into the plants, et cetera, that uh, emitted it or, or sent it up there in the first place. So uh, methane is completely gone from the atmosphere within 12 years and it's converted into CO2 and, and into, um, as I've said, water. So um, it's an entirely different thing to, to carbon dioxide. Um, and for those for that reason and many, many others, um, the, a lot of the talk about methane is, um, well, you know, that people say it's due to animals farting. It, it's actually not. It's actually due to um, burping, mostly. Um, but uh, there's a lot of bullshit talked about it. Um, so if we, if we looked at um, methane emissions from livestock globally, um, it's been estimated that over the last 10 to 12,000 years, there's not been any significant change in the number of ruminants on Earth. They've changed from, one or, uh, from a multitude of species down to less species, um, but in total mass, um, there's a similar number of uh, ruminants. Therefore, uh, ruminants can't be contributing to... Um, greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later as well. Um, secondly, uh, if we destocked Australia, for example, took all the sheep and cattle and all the other ruminants out of it, um, we basically would not stop the emissions. Um, the, the carbon dioxide would be lost during oxidation, either from uh, just straight oxidation or it would be burnt. Um, material left uh, on the ground uh, would be consumed by white ants, so they emit methane. Fires also emit methane. So, you know, our vegetation is part of the carbon cycle. Carbon dioxide comes into it, and it's going to go, that carbon dioxide and that carbon molecule is actually going to end up back in the atmosphere either as methane or as um, carbon dioxide, and then come back into the plants again as CO2. And the methane is going to convert into CO2 and come back into the system anyway. So um, why we've actually got to count livestock and not count what would happen if we didn't have livestock um, is beyond my simple little mind to work out. Uh, there's a lot more I could go on with, but I won't. It'll get too late. Um, so this is the the, uh, the hydroxyl oxidation. So when methane's emitted from an animal, um, belches, releases the methane. Um, it's converted into carbon dioxide and after 12 years through hydroxyl oxidation, um, which also goes into CO2 and water. So um, that's the process. 
Now, I want to try and clear up some language here around net zero and carbon neutral. Um, so let's start with, um, we'll start with baseline carbon. So we've, let's say we've, we've measured the carbon in our paddocks, one of our CEAs. We come back five years later, and there's an increase in soil carbon stocks. We've done our baseline emissions. We've got that baseline emissions there in tons um, CO2 for the property or the CEA. Um, and we come back five years later, and there's been a slight increase in the emissions. So before we can um, monetize that additional carbon, we subtract those extra emissions. So if the emissions are going up, we subtract them. If your emissions are going down, there's no benefit to that. You don't get any reward for lowering your emissions. I'll just let that sink in. Now, if you, over here on the right-hand side, if you've offset those emissions where your emissions have gone above your baseline emissions, um, you are now at net zero. You, if your product you can sell as net zero. You still have at net zero a whole lot of carbon credits that you can sell. And as I mentioned last week, um, the total emissions uh, are only about 8% of the total sequestration. So the emissions are a very minor part um, of this whole story. Now, if you wanted to be carbon neutral, you could then offset these emissions here, your baseline emissions, which means then that you would dive into those credits up there and retire them. So you put those credits, you would get those credits issued, go into your account, and then you would retire them and you could class yourself as carbon neutral. Should you become carbon neutral? I don't believe so. Every country in the world, every major business in the world is heading to net zero. And if you're doing a carbon project, you will be at net zero because you can't go above it. Um, I did some calculations for a, uh, a conference that I'm in Sydney for tomorrow. Um, and those calculations showed that if you wanted to be carbon neutral, consumers would have to pay you somewhere between about $1.12 and $2.78 per kilogram of live weight more for your beef or your cattle um, than they do now to overcome the opportunity cost of not selling those carbon credits. So there's a whole lot of hype in the media about don't sell your carbon credits because um, you know, you're going to have to need them to be carbon neutral one day. I don't know why people think that only the grazing industries or agriculture has to be carbon neutral because nobody else is. Um, so <clears throat> understand the difference between net zero and carbon neutral, get yourself to net zero. You can, you can make a choice if you want to for your own reasons. If you want to be um, carbon neutral, you can be by offsetting those emissions out of your sequestration and you would still have some credits to sell. You've got a lot of records to keep um, and uh, it's very critical that you keep these because the projects are audited to a very high uh, standard. Um, and so you need evidence of what you've been doing all the way through. We actually need to account, for example, for livestock by class um, every quarter for 25 years. So you're going to need good recording systems, um, you know, such as uh, my grazing, for example, or um, uh, you know, your spreadsheets or whatever, whatever else you use. Uh, but you're certainly going to need grazing charts if you're in the grazing game. I'll pull up there and uh, see what questions we have. Couple there already. Then uh, we have our transitioning from set stock up until August last year. So I've gone from approximately 10 hectare per head to two hectare per head. 
500% increase in density, paddock rest, but still doesn't reach thresholds. Isn't this enough for change in landscape and carbon levels? Depends what else you do, Ben. I think in the country that you're in, you're going to need legume, um, uh, which I mentioned last week. So you could have legume plus that increase, that's going to help. Um, and then uh, design your property up so that you start there, get the rest into it, get the legume into it. And um, in future, you might be able to go up another threefold and get, uh, get above the first threshold. Uh, thank you for clarifying the methane BS. This is something that bothers me from mal malinformed people, ruminants burp in feedlots, uh, not so much grazing. It's actually the other way around, John. They actually emit less methane from a feedlot than they do from grazing most of the time, uh, in theory. But um, what's not taken into account, so you, uh, it, when... When methane emissions are measured, they're measured from an animal with their head in a bucket, or with their, or they're measured in a in a shed, where the methane can be captured. They're not um, measured with their head on the ground. Now, in the soil, there are methanotrophs, and a methanotroph is is an organism that Mother Nature developed a long time ago to consume about twenty percent of the methane that an animal actually emits while it's breathing out and while it's grazing. So the healthier the soil, the more of those methanotrophs we're actually going to have uh, in the soil. Uh, and that's not taken into account either uh, in all this stuff uh, around methane. Um, um, can I show the monitoring information you need to do again? Uh, I'll go back to that if you like, Kel, and just a tick on this too. Let's get back there and put that on the screen while we're talking. Oops. There you go. Um, and uh, what are the main data management challenges that you face so far? Uh, I think the, the biggest issue is uh, uh, good livestock recording and good uh, property records. Um, and that's everything, um, fertilizers, fuel, um, livestock numbers, etc. cetera. All right, um, so we'll, no more questions on any of that. Uh, I'm surprised there's no questions around uh, um, carbon neutral versus um, uh, net zero. Well, I'm pleased you've all understood that. Uh, and uh, I think as an industry, agriculture needs to be actually standing up and, uh, and really starting to try and tell the real story about methane. Okay, we shall move on. Um, case studies and some real data. Um, so this is a property at Urala. The left-hand side is uh, continuously grazed. The right-hand property is uh, cell grazed. And uh, when you look into it, you'll see a, a fairly big difference in the volume of feed available. But when you look at the soils, you'll also see a difference uh, in the, the color of the soil. And that's partly due to moisture and partly due to carbon. So that property on the right hand side has been sequestering carbon at the rate of three tonnes per hectare per annum. So that's soil carbon, not CO2. Um, and that's sort of stuff I might expect, um, you know, in, in the New England tableland or, you know, cool environments, high rainfall and uh, a bit of clay in the soil. So a few results from WA. Uh, this is measured 0 to 30 centimetres over uh, up to six years. Um, low rainfall area. So this is around about 400 mil, um, basically in pure sand. Um, pasture was cut and removed. So about 1.3 to 2.6 tonnes of seed per hectare per annum. And this was using perennial grasses um, in that uh, in that area there. So getting perennial grasses into a, an annual system into deep sand. 
Um, and that result surprises me. Uh, those are amazing results for sand. Um, another one in WA in a similar region, um, north to 90 centimetres over 22 years. Uh, and this is using Tagasasti, um, which is tree loosen. Um, and this was measured between the rows in an annual pasture. And the change over 22 years was 0.9 of a tonne of sea per hectare per annum. Again, in those um, very sandy textured soils. Um, I think that's some of the better long-term uh, results that are around. And um, that's very, very encouraging. And if those, if we had perennial grasses growing between those legumes, um, and manage them, um, that sequestration would be much higher than that. The results from around uh, New South Wales, Southern Queensland, um, uh, Walker granite soil, uh, this is under the, measured under the SCARP uh, project. This is a cross fence comparison, uh, estimated at three tonnes of carbon per hectare per annum. Um, at uh, Bogabroy, uh, tropical pastures versus native pastures, two tonnes down to 90 centimetres. Um, you know, you can read those yourself. There's, there's three tonnes there from Urala. Um, Trap Rock region in Queensland, that's only to 10 centimetres. And it's 0.27 to 0.63. Um, and uh, that's that's pretty impressive. Um, you know, you've got uh, Cole Seister's info there, three tonnes. Uh, Irrigated cotton, um, irrigated cotton sequestering 2.2 tonnes a year over 10 years, average over 10 years, and that carbon was sequestered. Um, I think it was below 60 centimetres, but it was certainly below 30. Um, it was it was captured at depth um, and uh, also at Springshore. So that's just a few uh, bits of stuff. What I want to really share with you tonight is some real data. Um, this is the largest uh, carbon sequest soil carbon sequestration uh, set of projects in the world um, that have been measured uh, very, very accurately over a period of time in the real world. Um, so these are grazing properties uh, from central Queensland through to the North Burnett, um, Western Downs, um, uh, so southern downs, I should say, uh, and then down into the last ones uh, in northern New South Wales. Um, so you can see the size of those properties there. The actual CEAs were 76% of the total properties. Um, you'll see the rainfall of those properties and the five-year average. So these properties uh, were measured in 2016 and were measured again at the end of 2021. Um, You'll see their rainfall was uh, over average over that period uh, was 82% of their average. But you'll, I want you to notice the rolling total rainfall. So this is rolling total for their worst 12 months through there. Um, way, way under. So these are the years 2018, 2019. And some of you may remember um, and have a, a memory that you might like to forget um, around uh, 2018 and 2019. Um, so they all suffered severe drought, basically nearly three years out of the five um, where they were in drought, but two of those years were, were really quite bad. And they basically had rain in the first year and the last year. Um, one of those was completely burnt out in the 2019 bushfires. Uh, I did say this was real world. And the top three there also have had pasture dieback, um, killing up to 30 to 40% of their pastures um, throughout that five year period. So it's, and one of them's also had two floods. So pretty well everything that you could throw at these properties have been thrown at them. Um, so as I said, it's the real world. So this is a, a number of properties. Um, one property out of these didn't sequester carbon. Um, and then you've got the, uh, this is the annualised income at per hectare per annum, at $45 a tonne CO2. Um, now, the first three of these uh, real final numbers, uh, these bottom ones haven't been audited and 
uh, so these are in order to these are top ones now are pretty well completed or, or most of the way through their audits. Um, so you can see the, the income there uh, from carbon per hectare per annum, and you can compare that directly, particularly for those top four, to the annual income um, per EBIT from livestock production. So these are all cattle producers. Um, so the annual EBIT from cattle production over those five years compared to the carbon income. So I, I also looked at the last year, 2021, which was when cattle prices took off uh, and thought, well, what? how does the EBIT from livestock production in that year compare to carbon uh, value? And uh, you'll see even on these guys, uh, didn't match the carbon income. Um, so the, the, I said, uh, one guy hasn't sequestered carbon yet. Um, and they were, these were above average producers. You can see there's the um, average uh, in that 2021 year, the average production from our profit probe data. So, and this is, this, this economic data comes from profit probe, which is the RCS benchmarking in a business analysis system. Um, so I might just pull up there and see if there's any questions on that uh, before I move on, because I've got a few more slides around this, uh, around this sort of stuff as well. <laughs> John, you'd like to hear more about uh, methane? Yeah, I could uh, go on a bit about that. I'm not sure I should. Uh, John Whitfield, do, a, do we do a foliar biological fertilizer? No, it's not excluded. A biological fertilizer is fine because you're using relatively small amounts, John. So that's fine. Um, so if there's any questions uh, on that data, um, I'll, uh, no questions, so we'll move on. Um, um, what I also wanted to show you is that these projects are significantly carbon negative. So I've only got uh, those three there. The fourth one here, we haven't done, um, I don't have the emissions data uh, on that fourth one there yet. Um, so the top three, we've got data in uh, and uh, pretty well all through audit. Um, so you can see that these guys, so we've got 61 kilos, um, of CO2 sequestered per kilogram or per, sorry, per large stock unit carried over the five year period. So if somebody carried um, 10,000, uh, let's say, no, we'll go back to some of these are probably, yeah, well, these, some of these guys would have, would have carried 10,000 head if you added up over the, over the 10 years, a uh, five years, sorry. Um, so that means for the 10,000 head, each one of those, um, and convert that to a, to a large stock unit, each one of those large stock units has sequestered 61 kilograms of CO2 over and above all emissions. Now, the thing that's also noted there, notable there is that the emissions come from the grazed area, which is significantly higher than the project area. So the carbon has only been counted from the carbon project area, um, not the uh, the grazed area, but the emissions have been counted on the grazed area. So that's actually a conservative estimate of sequestration or how carbon negative um, these businesses are. Now, they can class themselves as carbon negative. They can class themselves as um, net zero, but unless they retire a certain number of carbon credits, um, they are not carbon neutral, right? So just to add to the confusion, um, they're carbon negative, but not carbon neutral. Um, so I think these figures are amazing. Um, and when you bring that back to kilograms of CO2 sequestered per kilogram of live weight, we're talking um, sort of between 100 and 300 kilograms of CO2 sequestered per kilogram of live weight run. Um, just mind-blowing numbers. 
So we can see the here the total sequestration. I showed you these numbers last week. Basically, there's three now that are going through the system. Um, so that's their total sequestration. Um, and that is sequestration. Total, that's total sequestration. Uh, I'm trying to remember whether that's before or after emissions now. I think it's uh, after emissions. Um, then we have net credits. So you'll see that there's a big drop on the total sequestration for the amount of credits sold. And one of the reasons for that is the statutory discounts. So the statutory discounts on the total sequestration those projects average between well were between 46% and 49% of their total sequestration was discounted. Now they do get 25% back at T2. So when we do the next uh, carbon measurement, they get 25% of that total back. And the reason for that is this is very, very conservative. Um, so that if something happened between T1 and T2, um, you basically got 25% of your total sequestration still up your sleeve. Um, and then on top of that, there's another 24% of the 25% of your total carbon that you're not allowed to sell anyway. Um, so um, it's a very, very conservative system. Um, and there's a whole lot of mathematics, et cetera, behind that. The other thing that's worth noting um, is based on the numbers there that we now have on uh, potential income from these credits. So they, the income is not there yet because these are um, one of these, two of these projects are still with the regulator. Um, and But this is the, the return on project investment. So that um, is a net return after paying for the baseline the T1 measurement and the commission that CarbonLink takes for doing the project uh, and maintaining the data. So you can see that after those costs, these projects are still highly profitable as carbon projects. Um, I might just uh, pull up here again and uh, see if there's any questions. No questions, well. That's uh, pretty good. Uh, some of you are slow typists, so I might just uh, wait there for a little bit. Um, So we've got to go still, uh, but um, if you, you know, if you want to do a soil carbon project with somebody with an organisation that actually has a track record, uh, has done the uh, the only large scale carbon soil carbon projects in Australia um, that has done the science over a long period of time um, and is equipped to do your projects, um, then express your interest with CarbonLink. Um, Again, right on. There's no questions and answers, so we shall move on. Oops, and popped. What's the average variance discount on projects? So uh, that's a good question, uh, James. Um, I'm just trying to remember that. Um, Got a feeling it's somewhere between 10 and 30%. Um, I'd have to, I really need to check with the scientists um, to give you that more accurately, but that's uh, that's my recollection at the moment. So that, that variance is already taken off that total sequestration numbers that I have there. Um, so uh, it's, it's already accounted for before you even get to start taking off the statutory discounts. But that's that variance that's so critical. And I think I showed you some data last week um, where we looked at um, the, um, 
when we uh, we looked at the variance, and I showed you some curves on um, on variance versus income. Um, and we do have all that data and we basically know how many uh, samples we need to take uh, to get that variance down. So if you're the higher your variance, the less credits you're going to get for the next 25 years. And having a, a low as low a variance as you can get on T0 um, is critical because you will be paying for a high variance in that for the next 25 years. Uh, on uh, the CSIRO look see app, um, the um, we we try to use a bit of that data, but at a farm level, um, it has no real relevance. Um, it's broad scale stuff taken from a few hundred samples around Australia, and and then uh, sort of modelled and mapped from there. But um, uh, no, we we have uh, we, we actually use it, but uh, only as a sort of a bit of an underlay, but uh, we find that it doesn't actually represent individual properties. It could represent a region um, <coughs> reasonably well. Um, so you get 70, 57% of all sequestered ACUs after the government take their cut in carbon links cut. Then I can only sell 25% of my ACUs and 25 are held until the following measure increases. Uh, let me try and do that. Um, No, you get to sell um, at T1, you get to sell um, or uh, it's about 75%, uh, sorry, it's a bit over 50%, just over um, of the credits. Um, and then at uh, from T2 and from then on, um, there's about 75% there's there's about of the credits that are then saleable from then on. Um, and the carbon link commission comes off the 75%. <clears throat> so it's a percentage of the 75. So it's not as bad as the numbers that you put up there, Ben. Uh, and Alan, I, I, I'm not familiar with the, um, the Scottish, um, I'm familiar with some of their measurements and what they're doing, but, but not their app. Uh, the loam fungus, yep, I think it's a fantastic thing. Um, it's a, uh, a melanitic endophytic fungi, uh, so it basically grows in the soil, and it uh, what it does is is um, creates microaggregates, and it stores carbon in the microaggregates, um, which are anaerobic, um, and that prevents oxidation of carbon that's been created. So. Um, I, th I think it's a great technology and I think we'll see more and more of that sort of stuff come on over the next five to 10 years. Right, I appreciate we're getting close to the end of the day. Um, I, I just want to make a comment about carbon dioxide generally. Um, this total focus on, on carbon dioxide and particularly on emissions without really thinking about sequestration, um, I think is going to lead us to some uh, lots of unintended consequences. Um, and so I think we need to, um, you know, look at the carbon opportunity in our landscape, um, but we need to think of more than that in our landscape and in our ecosystems. Coming down the track, and I think somewhere where carbon was uh, probably five to 10 years ago is natural capital. It's certainly not here yet, um, but there's a lot of work going on globally where people are starting to realise that certainly in our, in our landscapes and our natural systems, that carbon is only one part of the story. You know, there, there's the, the air and the water and uh, all the other living things and the biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, Coming down the track is being able to add uh, natural capital to your carbon. Uh, but basically, if, if you're able to add soil carbon and, and even potentially some um, tree carbon into your systems, that's going to add to your biodiversity and your natural capital, um, which will be a separate measurement and a separate source of income, hopefully over time, but it's got a bit to go. Um, 
And coming down the track right now that's driving this uh, is what I call the two big M's. Um, and that's markets and money. Um, the supply chains uh, in pretty well every part of agriculture today is starting to ask what, um, how do you, how are you going to report on what you're doing for your ecosystem? Um, and that's going to extend beyond that as well into social and economic or governance. The banks um, have also set a target to be um, asking for environmental impacts or what are you doing for your ecosystems um, by 2024. Now, I'm not sure whether that's 2023, 24 or 2024, 25, but um, the Australian banking industry has decided that uh, that starts uh, very shortly. So um, it's coming and it's coming very, very fast. Um, <clears throat> um, so somewhere along the line, you're gonna to need to start reporting on much more than just carbon. Um, all sorts of organisations, uh, <laughs> credits we see, uh, yeah, done deal already. Um, so what's happening is that, that uh, consumers are starting to, well, at least the supply chains are telling us it's the consumers expecting greater transparency. Um, and I'm not sure which one of them it is, whether it's the supply chain or the consumer or 2% of the consumers influencing the supply chain, which is probably where the reality is. Um, but um, it's coming down the track very fast where we are all going to have to start providing evidence of positive nature change. Um, and to, so, and being, you know, uh, creating positive change in natural systems. Um, so how do we get in front of that? Um, so one of the things RCS is doing is actually um, looking at creating a sort of reporting tool for you that um, we call FarmEye. Some of you online will have done Profit Probe, which measures business performance and production. Um, we're in the process of developing the farm portrait, which will measure and monitor ecological change and uh, and also well-being. So I won't spend that, but basically, um, you know, it'll be. These are the four main pillars, you know, people, business, production, and land um, are where we need to be measuring stuff. Um, just to show you quickly a, a case study. Um, we, here's a, you know, a ground cover measure over time. And you can see on this property, the ground cover increasing. And then we hit the pasture dieback and the drought. Um, there's a bit of measurement going on. So, you know, ground truth and parasites, looking at, um, you know, uh, what species are there, what biodiversity is there. So on this particular place, there was, uh, you know, 148 species and 72 species of native animals, et cetera. And um, some of conservation interest. Uh, when we start looking at um, natural capital and systems like that and measuring some of this stuff, it's gonna be important uh, what we're doing with our, riparian areas, uh, you know, there's measurements for that. Simply measuring things like water infiltration rates um, and looking at those uh, improvement runoff and you know, quality of water, uh, et cetera. So, um, I might uh, pull up there and we'll see if there's uh, any questions. Otherwise, I'll just introduce where we're going to go next week. I'll do that while we're waiting for any questions. Um, so if we look at, you know, what's going on in the rest of the world, there's the European approach at the moment where the big stick's coming out. And this these uh, pictures here are in the Netherlands um, where the government has said to farmers, you're going to reduce your nitrogen by 50%. Um, and so they've objected um, and it's very different. So that's what I call the stick approach. You will do this and you will, you will lower emissions, et cetera. And notice that the total focus is on emissions, nothing about sequestration. Um, the Australian approach is a carrot approach. What the Australian government has been saying to us now for 30, 12, 13 years is um, we will encourage you to sequester carbon 
we will allow you to sell carbon credits off your landscape. Um, and the focus has actually been on sequestration rather than on emissions. And I think compared to a lot of the rest of the world, um, that's a very sensible approach and being backed up at the moment by the data. So when you look at Europe and a lot of other countries, you now got government versus the people. And in fact, they're both right and they're both wrong. Um, you know, the government in the Netherlands, and this is happening in Ireland and in Poland and, and, and now in New Zealand, um, saying, well, you must reduce nitrogen by 2030. Um, and that's both right and wrong. Um, farmers are saying, well, that'll send us broke, and that's both right and wrong. The alternative approach, which we need to get onto, and, and I think Australia's done this much better than any other country, um, is you know the, the government needs to be saying to producers, we'll help you reduce nitrogen or whatever it is, or methane or whatever it is we need to do over a period of time. And then farmers need to say, yeah, we will switch systems um, to do that over a period of time while maintaining our yield. And I think that uh, that's where we need to get to. This whole get the big stick out, start beating people over the head is sure as heck not going to work. Um, and uh, if if people want to eat in future, then uh, they need to be pretty careful about uh, voting for governments that are going to go down this track. Um, so the change is uh, next week. Um, and uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on... Um, uh, on what we need to do to sequester carbon. So I will just wait in now, see what questions we've got. Uh, what are your thoughts on government setting a $75 a tonne cap on ACCUs? I said, bring on $75. Um, uh, $75 is, um, I won't broadcast what the uh, multiplier of um, cost of production that is because uh, I don't think we want it in the marketplace, but um, it's that if you can get $75 a tonne for your CO2, you'd be uh, laughing all the way to the bank. Um, and uh, you can see the profitability that's in these businesses at $45 a tonne. Um, 75 would be magic. Um, and I, I can't see them being able to keep it for very long, but um, we'll see how that goes. Um, Will rewards for stewardship of natural capital be from a baseline, i.e. additionally like carbon, or will it be rewarded for current state, your natural capital? Um, so firstly, uh, we, in, and I say we, as in RCS, have been working on a scheme uh, to try and uh, see how we can do this. And we have started by going backwards and measuring natural capital um, for people that have been doing it over a long period of time. Uh, and valuing that. So we we have been able to do that. We have been able to measure it without a baseline. So we can measure change over an extended period of time. It gets discounted because there was no baseline. Um, it's then been able to be valued. Uh, and the trick now is to be able to sell it. So we're, we've done a, we're in the process of a pilot project um, and we still don't uh, have that natural capital sold. But uh, if that system gets up and running, then it, you will be able to get rewarded for you know, what you've achieved in the past, Katrina. Um, the additionality is a really good question. Um, the market is asking about that. Um, what are you? How do we know that if we buy natural capital off you, that's still going to be there in five years' time, etc.? Um, and so we, it, we um, that's something that's got to be overcome. Uh, but I think even if, you know, there's a five-year sort of thing in it, then it's likely to get up. But, but um, yeah, that, that's to be sorted out. Um, but it's the Wild West uh, natu in natural carbon. They're, they're, we don't have the legislation. We don't have the regulation. We don't have the methodologies. And we don't have a market yet. So there's a lot of work to do in that space. Um, and now that's all been done in carbon. Now we can start... Um, looking at the rest of it. Is it possible to pool your carbon credits and auction them off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you will accumulate them in your own account um, and then you'll sell them uh, when you like. But there is a thing coming down the track 
uh, called vintage, um, which means that there will be a limit to how long you're allowed to keep them, and that might be uh, five to ten years. Um, probably something like five years. So if you uh, do T1, you've got your credits, um, you, you'll be able to keep those for about another five years before um, the the vintage might cut in. And that there's talk about the federal government introducing a vintage um, and cutting it off so that we're continuing to create new credits rather than just hold old ones. What's the difference between a biodiversity credit and a carbon credit? The carbon credit is where you've measured the change in carbon. And a biodiversity credit um, is where you're actually looking at, uh, you know, do I have more bird species? Um, am I, am I um, releasing clean water off my property as opposed to dirty water? Um, uh, have I got more frogs? Uh, have I got more plant species, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So those are, um, are biodiversity credits. Um, yeah, as opposed to a carbon credit, where carbon is just straight carbon. All right, we're on time uh, to finish up. So uh, next week we will spend our time looking at how we actually create carbon in soils. Thank you very much for your attendance. The, the uh, um, recording will be available towards the end of the week. Uh, and uh, if you just email Chris and uh, he will uh, give you the link um, towards the end of the week. Uh, five-year-old vintage accus and vintage. Um, so yeah, uh, it's the opposite to a wine. So a wine, uh, an older vintage gets better and more valuable over time and accu is going to get less valuable over time. So the further you get away from the time where it was created, the less value it will have. So they're not stuff for you to shove away and pull out in 25 years time because they'll probably be worthless. All right. Thank you all very much for your uh, questions tonight and your participation and uh, hopefully see you all again next week.